Okay, so I'm here in Dubai, in Dubai, with Gareth from Warwood, who had we actually met before? I don't think... I think we've only actually physically met this week when we've been doing this exciting. conference out here, although we've been in touch a lot and it's very exciting, yeah. yeah. So yeah, so here we are in oh, yeah. Dubai, uh, lounging by the pool, um, <laughs> and we thought we would catch up and uh, I would grab a bit of your mm. expertise. So um, I came to one of your sessions at the conference that we've been out here for. We're not just on holiday. <laughs> <laughs> really, right? We're working hard here. You <laughs> yeah, know. working really hard. Um, so I came to your session and it was about kind of um, low arousal and kind of managing challenging behaviour and that, that sort of thing. It'd be really good to get a bit of yeah, advice from you. But first of all, maybe if you could tell the people who you are. Yeah. So um, ultimately, I'm uh, a senker in a secondary school, free school in Stockport. I've been doing that for quite a while now, pushing up 20 years, I think. Um, and the long and short of it is we're a very inclusive school, so we've always had young people with many complex needs and disabilities, a uh, mainstream comprehensive school. And over the last couple of years I've been lucky to do quite a bit of research with colleagues at the University of Manchester looking at autism in mainstream settings and more complex needs. Uh, and from January, so literally just about a month in, uh, I've been really fortunate to be working 40% of my time with Professor Andy McDonald in Studio 3, um, developing educational packages based on their low arousal approach. So it's, what is the low arousal approach, what does it even mean? So in the essence, uh, Andy sort of founded this approach where he's looking at how uh, you'd work with young people with self-injurious behaviours, um, behaviours of concern in complex settings, uh, in using non-restrictive practices. So it's looking at environment, emotional regulation, uh, and understanding how we work with the individuals, also the carers of those individuals, be they the parents, the carers, or the, or the people that are professionals working with them. Uh, and, it, you know, my view is that if this can work in those complex clinical settings uh, um, with, with young people who have uh, quite high levels of dysregulation, you know, we can develop and draw on some of those key themes for school settings. Um, so the idea, this is kind of like the ultimate inclusion, I guess, isn't it? You're managing to, to keep everyone engaged and managing within a sort of mainstream environment. I, I think there's a, it's very easy now for people to say we can't meet need or that child can't come to my school because... Uh, and we've always had the view really, well, you should come to our school, how can we? And I think changing that around, one of my uh, good friends, Ellie Chappell, talks about this flip the narrative. So we're changing the view about saying, how can we? Uh, and in doing that, developing strategies that help everybody, because any strategy for a child with SEN or a complex disability or a different need actually doesn't harm children who don't have those needs. So what does that look like then? I mean, how do you make it work? So in essence, I think we've got to start with ourselves. I think understanding our own stress and our own levels of arousal is so important when you work with others. I think too often school systems are just looking at the end product, the child, the parents, the carers, the other staff, etc. We've got to think about ourselves first. Another key factor is our environment, you know, the, the, the emotional regulation within the environment, the physical environment, the emotional environment, the social environment, the communication environment are all key. And we wrote quite a lot about this in our paper, Mainstreaming Autism, Making It Work, which was published in 2011, looking at those environmental factors as a core part. So what does, that, what does the environment need to look like in order to make this work? I think there's several elements to this. The physical environment is one element of it. Yeah. I think the structure and the social environment is really important. But the key thing with this work is the look and the understanding about emotional regulation and the emotional environment. I think you can go into some schools and feel the charged nature of things. Um, and, you know, you can feel the tension sometimes in the airs. And it's about understanding how we create a calm, purposeful and focused educational environment. And that makes a difference, having that kind of calm feeling when you walk in rather than this charged, buzzy... Absolutely. And if you think you may have, um, you know, extrasensory needs or uh, you may react to that charged environment more, if it's calm, focused, purposeful, you're in a good place to learn. And ultimately, you know, nobody fights or runs when they're calm and relaxed and it's about just making sure that we've got that opportunity to build environments and learning uh, sessions around a purposeful way of working. So what you're saying basically then is let's take the most tricky kids um, 
because we love them, but they're tricky, yep. right? And then we're going to say, we'll try and teach them in a mainstream setting, let's keep it really calm. I mean, that's quite a lot to ask, though. It is. It, and I think that's why people don't do it, because it's hard, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and you get it wrong, you know. Yeah. Uh, and, and I think it's very easy when something happens, a blowout, a meltdown, an explosion, whatever people use these terms for, when it goes wrong or whether dysregulation is evident, yeah. to then just simply say, well, we can't do that. That's an yeah. exclusion or you're not allowed to come to our school anymore. Rather than that, those tough conversations about how can we modify and change and personalise the environment and the, the education we offer for that individual yeah. within our setting. So uh, another uh, colleague of mine, Dr. Damien Milton, talks about this idea of personalisation, not normalisation. And I think schools okay. that aren't inclusive are trying to normalise individuals within systems. Okay. And actually what you need to do is try and sort of craft the environment so it suits that individual. Absolutely. And their pathway through it. You know, so actually some of our learners need some time just to have that a social time or yeah. the time to do a different activity to help them self-regulate. Okay. okay. Uh, and I think sometimes just because a bell goes, or we're trying to shove people into the math lesson, whatever, that might not be the right time for that individual. So inclusion isn't necessarily about trying to make everything the same for everyone then? In fact, kind of the opposite. Perhaps. Uh, absolutely. I think that's where people go wrong. Okay. Where they're trying to force an individual into a situation that's prescribed, and, you know, the best will in the world. Some uh, head teachers may be writing their timetable for the next year on the beach or in a hotel in Dubai. <laughs> imagine, imagine that. <laughs> but the reality is that, you know, you're not going to know those individuals and how their response is to that because until you're there, you know, until yeah. you start in September. And, the, and also, you know, emotional regulation and those individual needs don't stop when a bell goes at 3.15. No. It's about a continuum over time and into the evening. So again, I think, you know, uh, different things like sleep patterns, nutrition and uh, exercise and things that can all feed into our states of arousal. We know that ourselves, if we're sleep deprived, we're going to be more ratty and, uh, you know, uh, a bit more annoyed and perhaps less focused, you know, as has been proved when it comes straight off a flight to Dubai. <laughs> but, you know, the point is understanding that is really important within how we work with families and those young people in schools. So in terms of like creating this calm environment that you talk about, I mean, what are the sort of key things that, you know, someone watching this, they want to achieve it in their, in their classroom, in their school? What, what can you do? What are the small changes you can make? To make so I, I think ultimately, again, our saturation model from the, the paper in 2011 highlights all those different elements that are really important. But I think, again, I come back to the fact that we've got to think of our own stress levels first. That's okay. the core thing. Uh, we then got to think about the need for how the structure of the day looks for that individual and not assuming or presuming that because it says maths on the timetable then or PE then that that's ready for the child, if that makes sense. Yeah. Uh, and then also, I think another core element of this is the education of the peer group. You know, we've got a large number of young people with hidden disabilities in schools, uh, you know, and actually in sort of 25 years, I don't think I've ever seen another child tip another child out of a uh, wheelchair or somebody pull out a bone anchored hearing aid but you do see kids testing boundaries with children who are autistic and you know if we educate the peer group I think one of the biggest untapped resources in our schools are the other kids. Okay so work with the kids. Absolutely. Trust 100%. them to actually be able to come on this journey a little bit with us. And that, that's about how the curriculum should re reflect society so you know how inclusive is our curriculum it's not just about how much people can access the learning to do with maths or history or English, but it's about how the images and the content in those lessons represents disability, ethnicity, sexuality, etc. So it's a bit of a bigger question. <laughs> it is, and I think that's why it's quite hard because it's many faceted and complex and there's yeah. lots of things that move and it's almost like I think squeezing a balloon, you get hold of one bit and the other bit yeah. bobs to the top and you get hold of the next bit and you really can't get hold of it all, you know. It's hard, and you also said about, so you start with yourself so mm. you you know if you want this calm environment it's got to start with you yeah um i mean that's quite a lot to ask it is and i, I wonder as well how many uh, professionals in schools actually do think about their own stress levels and have strategies or there's a real emphasis in supporting each other in knowing themselves yeah. if that makes sense i mean lots of schools do well-being activities and things but sometimes that can be almost having the opposite effect where there's a, a session after school that you have to attend for your own well-being, whereas actually yeah. the teacher might be better going home and having some time or going yeah. for a swim or uh, relaxing, for example. So again, there can be conflicts in how people try and implement various strategies, but you know, good schools have good support from the leadership of those schools. Uh, head teachers are strong, but also understand it's important about 
the whole community within their schools and supporting the staff as well. And presumably these ideas there around the kind of low arousal and creating the calm environment and being inclusive, this isn't just something for people who are trying to include uh, a wide variety of different kids in the class, this kind of should work for everyone I guess. Really. Absolutely. And, and you know, every single person is going to benefit from a calm, purposeful environment. You know, if there is a tension in the lessons or we always feel things that are on the edge as it were, yeah. you know, people are going to be anxious and therefore not be in the best place to learn. So calm. So we're calm. trying to get for that zone. We try and remain calm and I suppose it's uh, yeah. the irony of uh, doing this uh, <laughs> interview here. But, you know, you can't always eliminate risk. I think that's yeah. key. You know, you can manage it and you can reduce risk associated with things that we can get ahead of. But the key really is about being proactive as possible and so therefore we have to be less reactive when things happen or go wrong. And what if things do go wrong? How do you kind of rescue this? Yeah, I think at the end of the day, if somebody is in an extreme state of dysregulation, they are not available for learning or understanding. So you've got to allow that to calm. Yeah. And you might have strategies that you've worked with that young person on, or it may be the family have a great strategy that, that they can use and tell the school about. But then it's about planning after that how we change those structures moving forward. And, you know, we talk about these things like metacognition, learning to learn and things like that, about how we engage in a discussion about learning. And I think we should do that also in about our states of stress and emotional regulation. How many conversations do we have with young people about, you know, how they're feeling, how the routes into a certain situation occurred yeah. and whether they're able to reflect or use a system in the future to change how that might look if the same thing happened again. So part of this is about education, giving them the language or the tools to communicate what's happening so we can pick it up early as well. Really. I think it's, yes, it's about facilitating a conversation in that yeah. area. And it's not really, um, you know, some people stop me and say, well, pre-verbal youngsters or very young children, how can they do that and things? Well, there's many different ways yeah. you can do it with smiley face pictures and indicating an emotional state or having a set of egg cups with a ping pong ball and you drop the ball in whichever one you feel. So then our ways that we can engage in yeah. that, but actually when we're calm is the time to do it, you know, not when we're in a heightened state of arousal. Absolutely, that whole thing of, yeah, prepare for crisis, that's time to calm. You yeah. know, it's that old quote, you know, when somebody's drowning, it's not the time to teach them how to swim, you know, yes. so yeah. we better be careful on yeah. the edge. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Oh, brilliant. Thank you so much. I think it's a that's pleasure. really, really helpful. Thank you.